So that, that's one thing. There will be no if star at the next. Okay. When it comes to Alaska Totally, uh, which is the, the communal night prayer that is done after Salaka uh, that is a bit more complicated. And um, I don't want to make any promises um, in, in, in public. That information will be communicated to people. We're working with some of the other methods, um to develop uh, policy. Most of the messages that I'm aware of will be closed, at least at the beginning of Ramadan. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do expect by May 15th, for example, um, which will which will almost coincide with the last two days of Ramadan, um, I expect that there will be some restrictions lifted by then. Um, what we're looking at across the country, but specifically in Philadelphia, is that there will be a gradual lifting of the restrictions. So I don't know if you remember, before the stay-at-home order in Philadelphia, remember it was, you can congregate for only up to 50 people. Remember that? I remember, yes. yes. And yeah. then from 50, it went down to 10. Mm-hmm. And then from 10, it went to stay-at-home. Right. 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 So the reversal is, is going to be similar in a lot of places to how they were first implemented. So once they start lifting some of the restrictions, they're going to say you can congregate up to 10 people. Um, some of the stores will begin to open back up. Um, and then they're going to say 50 people until they feel like they're, you know, in the clear. Uh, they feel like the, the meta that right now the whole reason why um, these restrictions are in place uh, number one is to contain the virus. Uh, number two is because our medical system, if it, 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 too many people are sick at many times, it's overwhelming the medical system, and people who would normally uh, be able to survive with minimal treatment would not be able to get that treatment, and, and the disease would worsen, and they would probably you know, uh, die as a result. So in order to uh, keep down the, the death, of a minimum and be able to treat as many people as possible, you have to contain this thing for all while, right? So. No, 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 Shake. I'm, I'm, I don't want to cut you off, I, I, but I, I feel you. Okay, let's just say around May 15th, you know, there's the, a ban is lifted and a little bit of people can start congregating. Now, mm-hmm. from a layman point of view, don't it, to me, I would think that it would make just make sense. And the law knows best. If we just said, you know what, the things that we normally would do for Ramadan, we can't do them because that's we don't clear. want. Listen, yeah, that's that's clear. Let's not even look. The okay. That we would normally do that. There's nothing normal about this Ramadan. Right. This is the most. This is going to be a very, very different Ramadan than we normally deal with. So how is going to look, look like? Let's just put it like this. Let's just assume. Uh, I mean, especially for the sake of time. Let's assume that there is no Tarawiyah. There's okay. not going to be Tarawiyah at the next year. Because for most people, that's going to be the scenario. Right. Okay. How do we now deal with that as a Muslim? And I, and I, I need to I need to say this because I, I feel like I feel like it's it's um I feel like it's important that we understand that our Islam, our relationship with Allah, Subhanahu wa Taala. Our bond with our creator, nobody should come in between that. It can't be based on the fact that I get to worship with other people. Our relationship with the law can't be based on that. You know, and if we are, anything that we know is coming, anything that's important to us that is coming, we tend to prepare for it. Am I correct? I mean, let's just, you, I know you work with the, with the, I'm in law enforcement out there. You're, so you're in law enforcement. I'm you're seeing I'm see I'm seeing a totally different viewpoint, so much so that there aren't no warrants, no no major warrants being served. There's not a there's not people really getting locked up for uh, uh certain crimes that, that, that they're com that that they're committing. No, I got you yeah, have let me, let me. So, I mean, all, I, this, this is what I would do. This would just be my, let, let, my suggestion. No, no, let me, let me, let me, <laughs> let, let me, let me take a step back because I, I need you to, I need you to understand, I need the listening audience to, to understand this point. Right? Okay. Okay. Now, you, you work in law enforcement. Law, there's nobody that becomes an officer except that they do what first? They go through training. Right. Correct? 
Exactly. You can't just say, oh, I want to be a police officer. You show up the next day, they give you a uniform, they hand you a gun. You don't even know what to do with the gun. You wind up shooting yourself in the foot. You kill somebody else because you didn't even pick it up the right way. You can't do that. You have to prepare. Okay. Are you following me on that? We think, I, need, I, need I got to you. I got you. I got you. Anything that we, and anything that we know is coming. I mean, we have a lot of, a lot of our listeners, a lot of our constituents and, and our congregants, they're students or they were students. You know that the test is coming up. The final exam you got on the first week of May, you're going to prepare for it because you know it's coming. Okay. One thing that we definitely know is coming is death. Okay, we know that we are going to die. How do we prepare for that? You can't pray. You're not going to be with your friends and your family and the people who stood next to you in the mansion. They're not going to be in the grave with you. The Prophet wasallam, told us that there are three things that follow you to your grave. Yeah. Two of them go back and one stay with you. Your family follows you, right? Your wealth follows you. Some of your possessions follow you. And your deeds follow you to your grave. All of that's going to go. Your family and your wealth are going to, to, to go back. You're not going to have that with you. The only thing you're going to have in your grave with you is your, is your deeds. And we know that the prophet told us, that, that the believer in the grave will see this beautiful figure come to him or her. And he will say, what are you? And he will say, oh, I'm a al hasan I am your good deed. That is going to be your companion in the grave. Now, how do we prepare for that time of being alone? See, one of the things that is legislated for us, and it's interesting how, how it ties in the Ramadan, one of the things that's legislated for us to do in the last 10 nights of Ramadan, or the last 10 days, is to perform what is known as i'tikaf. I'tikaf means it, yani, or for a a general translation would be seclusion in the masjid. You are secluded. You're in the masjid, but you're secluded. You're not with anybody else. You're in your own space. You're reading the Quran. You're praying. You're remembering Allah. You're doing those things that draw you closer to him, and you're all alone because it prepares you for the loneliness that you will face in your grave. But that loneliness is only lonely if you don't have good deeds to go with you. And so now when we take a step back and we say, what can I do? This Ramadan, the COVID-19 Ramadan, which is crazy. I mean, because when we look back in history, that's what we're going to call it. Yes. And a lot of those stuff. You, you look at the, the 1997, the Hajj that was done in 1997. That Hajj is famously known as the year of the fire. It's when men had burnt down. Everybody who remembers the Hajj of 1997 it's called the year of the fire. This Ramadan that's coming up is going to be called Ramadan of COVID-19. A lot of those so the Ramadan of the virus, the corona, whatever, corona Ramadan. Now, how do we, how do we prepare for that? What, do, what does that mean? How do we use this Ramadan? How do we make the best out of a bad situation? Nobody, you know, if there are people who are saying this can be your best Ramadan ever. This is, this, this, no. No, it, it might be. It may be your best Ramadan ever. It's not the best Ramadan ever. There's no, nothing ideal about this Ramadan. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us for a reason. What can we get out of this? How can I make the best out of a bad situation? It's a bad situation. How do we make the best out of it? Now, here's what I'm going to suggest in the little bit of time that we have left. And inshallah, this is coming forth. I'm working with some other imams in the city. And inshallah ta'ala, we're going to put out a series of tutorials on how to best benefit from this Ramadan. And one of the things that we're going to be talking about is how do you pray the night prayer in your home with whatever Quran you know? And how can you start from now? We are, today is the 18th of Shabbat, right? Right. Meaning that Ramadan is going to be started either on the 23rd of April or the 24th of April, the, the third day or Friday, which means, which means that you'll be praying starting the night before the day of fasting, right, because the night precedes the day. So that being said, how can I now, from now until then, what can I do to learn a little bit more Quran? Can you make sure that you memorize, for example, from Surah Al-Asr, 
up to Surah Tanat. If so, then that means you'll have memorized 12 surahs from the Quran, which means you can pray 12 rakah. Each surah, you know, each rakah with a different surah. And then you can finish with witcher, right? And and how do you do that? And, and in the masjid, for example, when you normally pray for 45 minutes or an hour after he said, can you do that same thing with whatever Quran you memorize? Absolutely. Take your time. Recite it slow. As you as you learn these surahs, learn the meaning of wal asr. What does that mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by what is normally translated as time? But it's actually al asr. And we all know what salat al asr is. It's not just any time. It's the afternoon. And what happens after salat al asr? After salat al asr, the sun begins to set. Means that time is running out. Allah is reminding us, well, time is running out. In the insan alafi khusr. Mankind is at loss. We're all at loss unless we do those four things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us with right after that. Except for those who do what? They have faith. And they do righteous deeds. And they mutually enjoy truth. And they mutually enjoy that patience. Recite that surah. Let it sink in. Don't recite it like a man might recite it in a message because he's got people behind him and he can't stop. You can recite well, and you can pause and think about what it means. I'm telling you that you can take whatever you know from the Quran and you can pray every night yourself for the same amount of time that you would normally pray in the message. Let that sink in. As you make the as you bow, as you as you bow after you say uh, after you recite whatever you recite, you say, Allahu Akbar, and you go into Rukur, and you say, Subhanallah, al Let's say it 20 times, 30 times. You don't have to just say it three times. Mm. Stay mm. long in your sujood. And as you say, Subhanallah, al Ala, after that, call upon Allah. You don't have to, in your sujood, after you say, Subhanallah, al Ala, you don't have to make dua in Arabic if you don't know Arabic dua. You can say it in English and ask Allah for whatever it is that you want from the good of this life and the next. If you can do that, then you become the worshiper of Allah. Your worship is not based on the congregation. Mm. We can't be people who our, our deen is tied to what everybody else is doing because everybody else is not going to help you when you stand in front of Allah. In fact, Allah reminds us of that in the Quran. The day when a person is going to run away from his brother, he's going to run away from his mother, he's going to run away from his father. Nobody's going to be there to help you. Nobody's going to be there to answer for what you've done or what you haven't done. It's what we're supposed to do. And so we can actually use this Ramadan. Again, we're talking about making the best out of a bad situation. We're talking about making lemonade out of the lemons that we have, right? <laughs> um, so, I mean, to use, you know, to use our, our colloquial expression, because the reality is, again, this isn't an ideal situation, and we don't want this to be the way that Ramadan looks moving forward. We want to be able to, to celebrate with community. But if that opportunity has been taken away from us, then yes. let us realize, let us realize, and Allah is giving us another opportunity, and that is to use this Ramadan to perhaps become from amongst the people who pray the night prayer throughout their lives and not just in Ramadan. Maybe now that I feel more confident in my ability to do this prayer alone, I start praying more at night. I take advantage of that opportunity where Allah tells us that he comes closer to us in that last third of the night. And, and now I can call upon him and ask him for whatever I want. Again, again, my, my, my sole point in going on this, this digression is that we realize that we have to use this Ramadan to create a better relationship, personal relationship with Allah, and not that our worship of our Creator and not that our service to our Creator and then to his creation, that it is not based on the fact that I'm doing this in congregation. This is a big test for us. And, yes. and, and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with the best and allow us to pass uh, all of his tests. I mean, I mean, what